Hi everybody, Michelangelo Badio here for another installment of No Boundaries. How is everybody doing? I feel great. Just came back from recording with Manowar and we'll be finishing up next month. Uh, it's a fantastic album and we're actually doing two of them and it's really exciting. Now, I wanted to play a little bit before we start. up. I feel good. I want to say hello to a couple of people. Uh, Cynthia, John, Denny. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, Alexis, uh, Brett, Nick, Roxana, Jenny. Uh, it's uh, great to see everybody. I'm back home for a couple weeks and then uh, I have to leave again to go back on the road. Uh, and it's just exciting. You know, I'm really fortunate to be able to do what I'm doing. And right now, I wanted to talk a little bit about, sorry, I was like rocking out here. I wanted to talk a little bit about my, hi, Jenny, how are you? Uh, I see Roxana there, Draco, uh, Retro Puffer. Now, that's an interesting name. When I think of that, I think like, oh, dude, I like smoke bowl, dude, like good stuff, bro. Like, it's, it's like... Sinsmia. No, what was it called? Skunkweed, Humboldt County. Uh, I'm perfectly straight, so... But I remember those days, barely. Uh, Ozzy, that's pretty cool. Um, now, what I'm playing here is a Sawtooth USA guitar. Uh, as you know, you know, if you've seen my live streams, you know, I talk about the value of Sawtooth guitars where they're putting the best parts on and it's a really great value, a great price point. Well, this guitar's got Duncan's. Uh, it has these uh, custom etched pickup rings, uh, a Floyd Rose made in Germany. This is the best in the world. And uh, let's see what else on here. I like the matching of it. Uh, it's black and silver. So you see here, there's the black piece for the Floyd Rose, the black uh, screw where you tighten it up the Allen wrench screws, and then you see the silver. And again here, silver and black, but uh, they do a great job. Hey, Artie, how are you? Uh, Luke Man M, uh, N, M, F, uh, whatever that means. Uh, how are you? But it's great uh, to be back home, I have to say. I haven't been home very much this year at all. But anyway, I'm playing one of the... Now it's only it's only got 21 frets, which is kind of unusual for me. I usually use 24, many times 29, sometimes 36. So I've always been into extended range instruments. Uh, Brent asks if I'm using a gain pedal or amp distortion. Uh, 
I'm using a gain pedal. I, I like to use an overdrive pedal, but I also use a have to use a gain pedal. When you use software, a lot of times, yeah, there's pedals built in, but the, the overdrive on newer amps is so much more. It's crazy. Yeah, it's 21 frets. So like, you know, when you hear this, what I love about it is the pickup is much closer to the neck. I mean, okay, if that's 21, 22, 23, 24, so a normal neck position pickup, this first pickup would uh, would be actually where the second, you know, the, the single coil, the first coil would actually be by the second coil. So it's back here. So it's a little different. <laughs> You know, when I first saw John Five, you know, who, you know, he's a solo artist, plus he plays, uh, he replaced Mick Mars and the crew. You know, I always wondered, you know, why would you use this kind of shape, you know, the single coil, you know, country guitar almost shape with, with humbuckers. But then when I got some, because there's just something about this. You know, it just sounds great. Here's the uh, front pickup, because normally it would be a lipstick pickup, and then this middle posi position. Anyway, this is one of the USA Sawtooths, and one thing that I really love about the direction of the company is we were not pigeonholed or locked into a specific genre. A lot of companies, even my former company, was locked into this metal genre. Well, Sawtooth is not. Uh, there are a lot of artists in a lot of different genres. For example, Kenny Loggins' other guitar player plays Sawtooth in Bruce Dickinson. His solo act, not only does the guitarist Roy Z play Sawtooth, but the drummer plays Sawtooth drums. So you're starting to see them in a lot of different shows, a lot of different venues. And also Sawtooth sponsors the back line at the Whiskey A Go Go, the Viper Room, and KLOS. The Black Crows played KLOS recently, Sawtooth. Uh, who else? Puddle of Mud played there recently, Sawtooth Backline. And I got to see George Thorogood when I, last time I was in L.A., and I was backstage talking to him, and we really hit it off. And he gave me one of his slide, his uh, custom slides. They're these copper things. I'm actually pretty good on slide. One of the live streams, I should uh, show it. And I, I put it on my fourth finger mm -hmm. because that way you get to use your other three. So... <laughs> And so when he gave me the slide, I mean, he's great. You know, the band of the bone, ba 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 band. Yeah, he's awesome. And when I, when I watched him play, I'm watching him play the slide. Well, when he gave it to me, I didn't think, you know, I was very appreciative, of course. And, but I didn't try putting it on my finger till later. It fit about right to here. I'm like, hey. And so I'm thinking to myself, what, did my fingers get big over the years? But I've always had long fingers. But I, I've never, uh, you know, I don't use a huge slide, but it is just amazing. And I have a slide in my family room of my house. So uh, it's really good. 
and uh, that's what Sawtooth has been up to. You know, a lot of things behind the scenes, and now you know, just increasing the line. We've got some new MAB signature guitars. Now it's part of the signature series, so many of the guitars that you see. Unless you know they're the MAB Signature Series, you don't even know because it doesn't have my name. I don't, my ego is not so much that I need my name on everything. And, and I'm really serious about this. I don't need it to say MAB or have double guitars here, 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 and here. Like, I, I, me, me, who do you want to be? Me, 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 I, 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 I. I'm not like that. So what I did was just keep it part of the signature series but uh there are some great guitars can you play a few of mental rock i don't even know what mental rock is i mean uh, you know i don't even want to go there because somebody will get mad at me okay let's see um okay we need to ban that guy right there do you see that yep bye dude so anyway I have no tolerance, I'm not kidding, <laughs> no tolerance for any BS on my page. Just say what you want outside of my page. You don't to say anything. Okay, hey Kathy, how are you? Okay, anyway. What I wanted to play is I wanted to show you guys my warm up. Now, you just saw me play. I would, I, you know, I would say this about the way I, I look at guitar. There are so many people playing guitar. There are so many teachers nowadays. There's so many ideas. We are in a guitar renaissance uh, when in the 19, for example, when you heard guitar playing in the 1950s, when you think of Bill Haley and the Comets, uh, or even Elvis's guitar players, they came from a jazz or a country background. So their sound was more clean because they really didn't have distortion amps and a distortion pedal wasn't invented yet. You know, so you hear a lot of things. You know, from the Beach Boys to the Beatles. You know, so you hear these clean sounds. Chet Atkins, a lot of country, a lot of jazz. And, you know, I love this riff by... Uh, uh, by Charlie Christian, and I studied jazz when I was a kid. I love these augmented 11s. The chord of death! Look at that chord. It's an ugly chord, very ugly, but it resolves. I love it. And so what I loved about it is you have to use your thumb. And I mean, you're using all six strings in Shake it like a blues player. Put your thumb proudly over the neck and he dunk it. And so that's what I do. I practice very hard on my vibrato. Getting back to what I was talking about as far as my practice regimen. What I learned is this. When you look at different eras, and like I said, this era of guitar, we have the greatest guitar players that have ever played technically. I love it. I mean, the thing about guitar is just when you think nothing else can be done, something new can be done. There's no other instrument on the planet like a guitar. A keyboard, a lot of, if, if you think before synthesizers, the only thing that separated another keyboard player was their skill level. They couldn't make a key sound any different than anybody else. They could have their own style, they could have, but it was really a skill level and a way to play it that separated, not the tone. It was different with guitar. If I pick up this guitar and play, I sound like myself. If Jimmy Page played this guitar, or Jeff Beck, that Charlie Christian or Eddie Van Halen, we would all sound different. That there's something so unique about the guitar. Now, granted, when keyboards got sounds and they got, you know, all these different things to almost emulate guitars, which they can emulate them now, they were able to express themselves in many different ways. But it's still not like a guitar because there is a certain 
thing about your fretting hand, your picking hand, what pick you use, do you use your fingers, and how you perceive playing this instrument that it's, there's so many variations. No instrument on the, in the world is like a guitar. Well, I've made a study of it, which is why my instructional programs are so popular, but it's also why I can play the way I do in the style I want to play. And I'm playing faster now than I was even before. But I, and I play so many different styles of music. Just go to my pages, go to my YouTube page. You can hear me play acoustic guitar with the pick, flat picking, super fast and clean. You can hear Fusion now. I just posted a clip of a great Fusion song I did called Avalanche uh, with two brothers, Mike and Rob Silverman, who, who developed the drumology thing. Uh, it's Autumn Hill Records. They are amazing musicians. They've had everybody play from Dave Weckl and Dweezil Zappa to John Patitucci on bass and me on guitar. And we produced uh, just an amazing track. So just on my page alone, you can see me play acoustic. You can see me play jazz and fusion. You can see me play shred and metal. You can see old nitro. You can see man of war where I'm playing almost blues. Which is going. You know the song from ba uh, the solo from Battle Hymn, and and so the point is this: I love playing different styles of guitar. And that's one of the reasons I like Sawtooth so much, that it's not just pigeonholed, maybe that's not the right word, but it's not genre specific as a company. But here's what I learned. You have the 50s guitar players that were more jazz and country. You know, country and bluegrass, you know, there's jazz roots and all this. I mean, these people are playing, you know, non-chord tones, chromatic passing tones, mixolydian, you know, it goes on and on and on. 60s, you had the more Hendrix style. said West Montgomery. What West did was this. He did the actors. He played with his thumb, but what he was really famous for, somebody mentioned West Montgomery. When I, when I was uh, 12 years old, I learned a song called Stormy. In fact, I'm going to go so far as to say John Legend completely ripped off that song. Save Room for My Love is an absolute direct plagiarized ripoff of Stormy. And so anyway, it goes... Now, I came up with this solo, that one... On the verses, I learned this. Okay, wait, okay. And so that was West Montgomery. The popularized octaves and then George Benson took it to a whole new level. George Benson is one of my all-time favorites. I've seen him in concert. I've met him and talked to him. He's just amazing and he can sing anything he can play which is mind-blowing. And so um, what I can tell you is this that over the decades there has been times where guitar has taken like a quantum leap. See in the 60s it didn't really take a technical leap. It took an emotional and sonic leap. So you had people like just getting these sounds, making your guitar top. You know, I 
can I can scat sing too. And and but, but anyway, it was the tone, it was the the power, the angst, the aggression. I mean. <laughs> So in the 60s, you had this renaissance. It was, it was a 180. It was completely the opposite of the 50s, where a, a most, um, virtually every guitar player had that. They had a very clean sound. That's all they had, was the amps. All of a sudden, the 60s, distortion, fuzz. All these sounds came in. Um, just even something uh, as simple as I mean, just the tone of the guitar was completely different. Then, so you had this technical level in the 50s that was amazing. 60s, you had this tonal, uh, this migration to this tonal, uh, this rock sound that nobody had ever heard before, making guitars make sounds with wahs and distortion that no one had ever heard, and it was a certain power. There was a certain feel to it. Then you go into the 70s, that was the era that started fusion. So you had people like Jeff Beck doing, uh, you know, the... Freeway Jam. You had people like George Benson. You know, you were, you were here like. And then you had uh, what was the song? Uh, In the Dead of Night. The band UK. Alan Holdsworth comes out. He's like, you know, like. He was so outside. Nobody knew what the heck he was doing. I mean, it's like, I know, knew Alan Holzer. I tried talking to him about music. All he could talk about was imported beer. I'm like, what? You know, I, I we were recording the first Nitro album. And he was, he actually lent us his Tama kit when we were recording our first album. Bobby Rock had a sonar drum set in it, and the shells were thick and great kit, but it didn't record really well. It was thick and, like, beefy sounding, and so we used Alan's kit. Why he had a drum set there, I don't know, but we used it, a little bit of trivia. But one of the things that happened in the 70s, again, n now you had this overdriven sound of the 60s and the jazz of the 50s fused. So you had jazz and rock, hence fusion. And so you have all these bands, and all of a sudden, you know, John McLaughlin, Al DiMiola, all these great players. And I mean, it's so great. The music, and then get to the 80s, the Ingve generation, the MAB generation, you know, where we sought to take, see, my goal was this. I realized a long time ago, uh, studying music, that the level of musicianship always equaled the genre in which they played. So, for example, Johann Sebach's, Yo Johann Sebach's, Johann Sebastian Bach's musicianship is here. His music was here. Mozart's technical facility on keyboard instruments was here. His music was here. Okay, for the first time in history that I know, you had rock musicians in the 60s, their technical proficiency was here, but the music was here. You can't write really a better rock song than ACDC or Zeppelin or, you know, look at Jimi Hendrix or Clapton, but where you could improve upon is the level of musicianship. And I don't take that, I don't mean that Hendrix couldn't play great, I'm talking about a technical facility. If you want somebody to be the first chair violinist in the, in the symphony orchestra, all throughout history, the players equaled the genre. The, the players were here, the music that they wrote was here. For the first time, the players were here technically, not musically, technically, 
but the music they wrote was still at that highest cerebral level where you just go, wow, listen to this. And so my goal was, and I think what happened is all of a sudden, you know, because rock music always had these fantastic songs, but you're not going to say it's the greatest virtuosos playing that music. Mozart knew much more about music than Paul McCartney. Now, does that make Paul McCartney less of a writer? I don't think so. Paul McCartney's music is at the highest level, and he could do so many things. So what my goal was, was as a teacher, is to bring that level just like it was in all the other genres. Think about jazz. What do you think, that Charlie Christian couldn't play great, or Django Reinhardt, or Pat Metheny, or Pat Martino, or George Benson, or Joe Pass, these people were the greatest players they could possibly be playing the greatest music that was there. So what happened over the years is the 80s started just coming out screaming. You know, you've already had Van Halen in the 70s. You had myself in the 80s doing the first instruction. And so I wanted to show that because, see, a lot of people still think, oh, dude, no, you, know, you should do, but there's no feeling. It's such an old, tired, worn-out cliche. They've been saying that for centuries, centuries. They said it about Mozart. They said it about Liszt. So, you know, the, the, the prognosticators of evil, doom, and negativity and gloom, let them talk. Who cares? Just don't come to my page and talk. Talk about me anytime you want, anywhere else. But coming to my page, I've said it a million times, it's like coming to my house with dirty shoes and walking on my brand new carpeting. You don't do that. It's rude, it's disrespectful, and you don't get a second chance to walk in the house. And so, but why I'm saying this is that once the 80s hit, all of a sudden another renaissance... And so many of those guitar players, including myself, are still here and we're still doing really well. Why? Because we had a technical facility that was close to the music that was created. There's something about good that just hangs on. Good is good in any decade. Might become more popular in one decade or another, but good is good. So in the 90s, ah! <laughs> what can I say? We had Kurt Cobain. I love Kurt Cobain. He didn't really exactly play leads. And I, I remember somebody at a clinic one time, I'm in the 1990s, and I go, hello, is there any questions? Can anybody, does anyone have any questions in the audience? And this kid goes, I got a question. I go, well, what is it? He goes, guitar solos suck. I'm like, well, that's not a question. But he goes, guitar solos suck. And I thought about it for a second. Everybody's looking at me in the audience. I was in Seattle, of all places. Shocking. And so, anyway, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking for about a nanosecond. I go, look it. I go, you might think guitar solos suck. I go, throughout history, there's always been solos in songs. You know, the lute from, you know, I mean, it was a rhythm instrument, but solos have been a part of music for centuries. And I said this. I said, it doesn't matter if everybody in America thinks guitar solos suck. I said, outside the United States, they don't think that, and I'll tell you what, if no guitarist in the United States wants to play a solo, it doesn't matter. I will play enough notes for all of you so we've got the USA covered. And that's exactly how I thought. I didn't care. What? Let them say what they want. I love Nirvana. I love Alice in Chains. Jerry Cantrell couldn't believe that I actually liked him when he read an uh, interview with me saying that they were one of my guilty pleasures because I love the idea that all the grunge bands were using mixed meters. <laughs> riff. I don't care what decade it's written in. That's a killer riff. So I liked a lot of grunge music. Move it to the 2000s. Around 2003, 2004, after new metal. Okay, new metal, again, no solos. So you had this decade where rock music, again, took a technical leap to the bottom. And But the music has always been here. People love songs and music. So it doesn't matter if you're the greatest musician in the world. It's been proven time and time and time again. If your music 
reaches for the soul and hits it. If you feel something from somebody's music and, and, if, and enough people feel it, that's when you get there. And it's been like that throughout history. The difference is the skill level of the people playing it. Right now, today, more people are shredding than ever. Shredding is a way of life. It's part of it because as critics tried to criticize it, what they actually did was they didn't realize it's not the word. It's about being good on your instrument. We have now is absolutely equaled on guitar the level of the music that's being played and heard again. But this, they've taken it in new directions, and that's what I love. My goal as an artist and a teacher was to say, look it, this is the way it is historically. We need to get the level of technical facility up to where the music was. So here's what I'm, I'm living proof today. I think that was my life. Speed kills, all the stuff that I talk about, that's exactly what I do. Adam, can you hit the drum? Uh, I use fingers one, two, three, and four in this. I'll go like this to a beat. Just like this. All the way up to the 12th fret. Then once I'm done, we go. I'm 
listen to where one is, sometimes I don't. You can vary it, but what are you doing? You're practicing dexterity and timing. Your timing is part of this. Wow. timing is dead on. And you know, I had a funny thing. In my Van Halen medley, I'm unshaken. <laughs> guitar player that I actually know and he's got barely 3,000 fans look I'm not criticizing but this was insanity and I know this person he's he writes on you know this post that's blowing up on my Van Halen medley writes the the bends are out of tune he can't even hear that it's D major which is an F sharp going to B flat which is an F and I made a very clear distinction <laughs> And you can hear it, and it's perfectly in tune. Did I write back? No, because I, I'm not going to, you know, it was somebody else that was sharing a video with me and, and tagged me in it. But it just shows the ignorance sometimes that, you know, and, and somebody that I knew, I was really surprised about that because, I, as you know, I don't criticize anybody, and I sure don't post criticizing anybody, but to read this, and they were so theoretically incorrect, and they couldn't hear the nuances that when I, you know, somebody mentioned earlier in the night, oh, what song am I talking about? My Van Halen medley, in the unchecked. <laughs> F sharp and an F. And I made that distinction very, very clearly in the vibratos. And some guy that, like I said, I know, the bends are out of tune. I'm like, I wanted to say, dude, you either need a new pair of ears. You might be, you know, because no one really criticizes someone, you know, put it this way. People that are doing better are the ones that get criticized by the ones who aren't. It's usually that way. I'm not going to say nothing's 100%, but a lot of the pundits online are not doing as well in many different ways as the people they're criticizing. Now, does that mean that it's fair? No, but life's not fair. But when I read that, I thought, 
that's one of the dumbest things that I've heard. And it sounds like a bitter person because they couldn't differentiate between the D major F sharp when I bent it and when it went to B flat and F, I bent it perfectly to F. And, and so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. But I wanted to show you a little bit about my practice regimen because groove is everything. Adam, can you hit that again? I'll pump it up to like, see where it says 200? On there? See, I start, sometimes I start at two usually. That was 185 to show you, but I never play anything less than a 16th ounce. Is this two? <laughs> idea is this. One of the things that happened when I was younger, uh, when I got signed to Atlantic Records and the band Holland, the producer Tom Worman, who did Motley Crue, Poison, Cheap Trick, I Want You to Want Me, Motley Crue, She's Got the Looks That Kill, or Girls, 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 uh, Poison, Every Rose Has Its Thor, uh, Dockin', all the great Dokken albums, even Ted Nugent. Stranglehold. He did all these amazing records. And he did the Holland album. And he told me one thing about my playing. He said that, uh, thank you about the Van Halen thing. That's what I was saying. You know, some people, they just want to snap to judgment, but you have to listen. And uh, anyway... What Worman said about me was, he said, you know, Mike, you're a, you're a great lead guitar player. He said, but you're a great rhythm guitarist. And that's the thing that I've really prided myself over the years. Uh, for example, uh, Adam hit 200 again. What? <laughs> a specific start and ending point and you lock into this that's when you start getting a groove and I've always had that groove I have played to, to quantize drums since I was a little kid and I didn't even know it and what I did was this my parent I play piano my parents had bought a Lowry the brand name organ 
It was an organ with, with two keyboards. They were about this big, one here, one here. They had bass pedals and they had drums built in. And the drums had like do 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 So I had bossa nova. <laughs> And they had a shuffle beat, and they had this like, and so they had an octave of bass pedals. So it was C to C, and I used to play like, I would just have this drum machine go and then there were some fills like one of the uh, drum beats was a marching so I would sit there and play and I'd go and so I came up with these fills I was like this one man band but what I did not know is I was working on my timing I didn't know this because I was able to lock with the drums playing bass I would just hold the notes C B flat, A flat, G. And so it was very, very interesting to me. And as I grew older, I started talking about this in my instructional programs, about these exercises that I do. I study classical harmony. That's what my degree is in. It's very different now. You know, we called it well-tempered tuning. Now they call it equal temperament whatever they want to call it. I don't necessarily agree with these, a lot of the new words. I think that uh, there was a reason why Bach wrote the well-tempered clavier, uh, because uh, it's, it's a whole thing about tuning versus another uh, uh, style of tuning that we learned called mean tone. But anyway, the moral of this story is this, that what I tell you that I practice is what I practice. And I practice what I preach, but I've always had a groove. And if you listen to my my songs and my rhythm guitar playing, it's always spot on because I've worked my whole life being a really good rhythm guitarist because there's a certain groove and you know, you've either got it or you don't. And, and my timing is really good. And it's good because one, yes, I had natural ability, but that's not enough. You have to practice this. You have to be able to play on the beat. And then sometimes, for example, in Man of War, Joey wants it to be slightly behind just like Black Sabbath and all the other amazing metal bands that are out there. It's not, and it's not just in metal, but there's a groove. Like when you hear Warriors of the World United, it's this feel. And knowing how to play to a click enables you to vary it and know how to play to drums and move it around. But anyway, um, I really, you know, getting back to Sawtooth, I haven't talked much about it today, but... I think the proof is in listening to me play. You know, I can talk all day about a guitar, but sometimes you just need to shut up and play. I've released, a, a, I was part of a great fusion song that just came out called Avalanche. You can see a little bit of an excerpt of it uh, on this page, my Facebook page. It's on uh, YouTube as well. Uh, it's uh, Rob and Mike Silverman. They are two brilliant musicians. Uh, brothers. Uh, the, Mike is the keyboard player. Rob is the drummer. They are both amazing. Uh, they've got a fantastic array of artists they work with, and I'm just very happy to work with them, and I'm going to be doing more fusion jazz style stuff, neoclassical with them. It's just incredible. It's a lot of fun. And also, too, uh, I released, uh, I'm on the new Dragon Force video. Herman messaged me, uh, when was it, this morning? Maybe this morning or yesterday. I can't remember. I've been all over the place. But anyway, he messaged saying, would it be okay uh, if he used a shot of me on his new uh, video? So if you watch uh, the new Dragon Force video, believe it or not, a Taylor Swift song, and I'm telling you, they kill it. 
It sounds like a Dragon Force song. I told Herman, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. When I say this, I said, I think you have another hit song on your hands with this new version. It's awesome. It's Dragon Force to the max. And then there's a, a picture of me, a picture, there's a, a short video cameo of me playing on there. So I was very grateful uh, to be on this. So check that out. And then we ha I have this version of Man in the Box that's coming out. Wait till you hear this one. So there's a lot of music in the pipeline uh, that I do. I love to do different genres and styles. My heart is metal, but also too, as you've heard today, this is a little insight of how I practice, how I perceive things. And my programs are not just meant for me, they were meant to help you. And so in conclusion, Joey felt good today. Robert is angry. He's always angry. He was angry today, even more so than usual. But anyway, Joey, Robert, and myself say, see you next week here on Michelangelo Badio. See ya!